violence against women and girls is not a new phenomenon. It's something you've read on the newspaper, you've seen on TV, you've even recently seen on social media, or something some of us here might have experienced. As a girl child, it's as though being born into the world is a crime. From pre-selective abortion, in, in cultures where the boy child is preferred for the sake of longevity, thank you, longevity of the family name and the entitlements and products, as though the girl child does not deserve to earn anything, to the stage where a two-month-old baby is being raped, not because of what she wore, not because of where she was, but just because she's a girl child. As a young girl, I've seen so many girls forced into early marriage, early parenthood, taken out of schools to become mothers of children while they are also children. As an adolescent, and even in marriage, there's a common factor that cuts across, and that's rape, sexual harassment, sexual abuse. Globally, 125 countries accept that domestic violence is a crime. But the same 125 plus two more countries, making it 127, does not decriminalize marital rape. Because of course, when a woman is married, she becomes a property and she can be violated at the pleasure of a partner. Why are we passionate about ending violence against women? We're passionate because of a young girl called Ochania who was raped to death by her uncle and his son. We're passionate for Obiamaka, a young girl who went by every societal standard of dress well, speak well, stay at home, close your legs, but still got raped in her parents' home while preparing for an exam. She wasn't only raped, a stone was used to open her skull and she died. Violence against women and girls is not just a pity party. It has an economic cost. When you see or when you hear about a case, all you see is a person who has been raped. But what I see is an economic cost. What is the cost of that violence on that child? Every survivor of sexual violence has to go through health care, has to get mental health support. For some of them, they get physical injury. For some of them, they become disabled, and in some cases, they die. For cases as well, you have to take care of the legal cost. You have to pay lawyers, you have to pay the police to, to facilitate your case to the court. You have to pay all of these things. I wanted to show you what this cost will mean, because you might see it as an individual cost, but it also has a cost on businesses on government and on society. For individuals, there's every chance that when you get raped, you have to leave work because perhaps your abuser works with you and you can't bear to see them every day. Or you need to go to court because court will never work on a Saturday for your sake. They will work on weekdays, which means you have to take time off work for you to get justice. For businesses, one staff who leaves the office and is not there to work, there is a gap. Loss of revenue, loss of human capital. For government, it takes more from them. For government, they need to create more healthcare system, more social services. They have to increase their police and justice system. They have to re get reduced tax revenue because the taxes that you pay that I pay needs to be used to take care of a survivor. And on the society, you get to pay more tax because government needs your money to create services. And whereas government should be focusing on education, on providing health for maternal mortality, it needs to focus now on helping someone who has been raped. So that means you and I are contributing to taking care of a survivor. There was a study that was done by the Commonwealth, which I represent, for you to have an understanding of what exactly this cost looks like. Five countries 
were researched on, and I'm going to use African context, because of course, Nigeria is part of Africa. In South Africa, 28.4 billion, between 28.4 billion and 42.4 billion rands was spent on violence against women in their country in 2012. In Uganda, they spent 56 billion of their currency to deal with issues of sexual violence. Ending violence against women and girls isn't just beneficial for women, it's also beneficial for the government and for you as individuals. For Ochanya, who died, that could have been the next person creating the greatest solutions a man could hear about. Or for the Obiamaka, who, was, who is gone, that, could, that is a child who could have been in school, get an education, get a good job, and lift a family out of poverty. But she is no more. We must end violence against women and girls. For girls who are taken out of school and married at a very young age. We must end it for parents who have to bury their children who have been battered by their partners. We must end it for girls who have every chance of bleeding to death out of female genital mutilation. We must end it for girls who have been sexually abused and have to live with the eternal scars. Mental health is not an issue that is to be put aside. For survivors, they live with this issue every day of their lives. There is no expiry date to the hurt, to the pain, to the, to the memories of seeing your abuser go scot-free on the road while you are hurting. Preventing violence against women and girls is a return on investment. Because when you invest in education for the girl child, and you invest in health, you are enabling them to get educated, to get good jobs, and to get into leadership positions. The International Labour Organization said that if by 2025, we're able to close the gap between women and men by just 15%, $5.8 trillion will be invested into the world, world economy. That's a lot of money just by doing one thing to prevent violence against women and girls. It's a return on investment and it's important for all of us here. Let me take you through the prevention mechanisms. The primary prevention is basically creating behavioral change programs, teaching boys in schools, in your homes, even teaching girls alike about human rights, about bodily autonomy, about agency. This doesn't cost much. You can just call your brother right now and speak to them. Call your sons and talk to them. It doesn't cost anything. For secondary prevention, when you realize that someone has very violent masculine traits, it doesn't cost you anything to register them to an NGO who provides support, like Stand to End Rape Initiative, where we teach boys to change their very violent orientation some of which they have gotten from watching pornography. We are there with our counselors, helping them. We understand the value of themselves and the rights of other persons. The tertiary prevention is basically creating social services for women who have been violated. As you can see, these are very easy things to do and very cost effective. Now take a look back to how much a country spent on taking care of victims and survivors of violence against women and girls because they did not do this. In Nigeria, it's even more difficult to know how much are we spending on responding to sexual violence because we don't have data. And data is very important because it helps you analyze, is your programming working? Is your strategy working? Do you need to change something or do you need to fix it? To determine the cost, economic cost of violence against women in Nigeria, we need to do these steps. We need to advocate our policymakers to understand that creating bills and laws that protect the rights of women and girls is not a request. 
It is a demand. And it needs to be passed with urgency. Starting from the Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill, which has been thrown out of the House five times, is as it's like saying that women should have rights, but don't have too much. Women should exist, but don't ask for too much. We need to establish and implement methodologies to understand the data gaps. If I ask anyone here in the house, what is the number of women and girls who have been raped in Nigeria in 2018? We probably do not have that data because our country is not focusing on this issue. We need to build the capacity of human resource to keep data across sectors, for sectors in the health and legal framework to work together. We also need to support cooperation among different sectors. We need to implement and improve our accountability and learning frameworks. Preventing violence against women and girls is the most cost-effective thing I know in my entire life. It doesn't take much for you to speak to someone about sexual violence. It doesn't take much for you to stand with survivors when you hear their stories. When someone comes forward with their story and all you do is pick holes, or you question their stories, or you disbelieve them, not because their stories are not valid, but because you just want to be certain they are not lying. Rape is not something you want to lie about because it brings you no money, it brings you no good fame. Rather, it brings you stigma, mental health deprivation, stress, suicidal thought, and sometimes it brings death. So I'm asking everyone here, it's a call to action to support every survivor that you know or you hear about. Because whether you do this or you don't, you are paying for the services that they receive. And the more you ask for good roads, you ask for better health sectors, you ask for education and every other basic amenity, the more government needs to invest all of your ask into addressing this issue as against preventing it. So it's economically and virtually, morally, financially wise and smart to invest in preventing violence against women and girls. I work in this sector every day of my life, and I hear stories that break my heart. But I'm not just seeing stories, I'm seeing the money, because CSOs have to step in the gap where government is failing. We have to take care of the survivors, find them shelters. In some cases, when they have children, we have to resettle them. All of these things cost money. How about we take that money and put more girls in school, more, more health sector programming, more capacity building for all of our sectors? I am a survivor of sexual violence, and I understand the hurt. I understand the pain. And I understand the cost, and I hope you do too. Thank you.